I'm Steve Gribshaw. I'm a special assistant to the director embedded in the Strategic Technology Office to facilitate transition. And I appreciate that you all are joining us this afternoon. So, transition to operations. So think about when James Bond walks into Q's lab. There's probably something on fire. There's something in the background that you look at it and it looks really cool. But when you think about it, you realize it's never going anywhere. It doesn't serve any purpose. It's just cool. It's never gonna be innovative. Then there's the thing. And you're just like, yes, that's the thing. The crazy idea that developed into reality and is now on James Bond's wrist or in his pocket, maybe in his car, details don't really matter. Bottom line, this is a successful and an exciting transition, a transition direct to operations, the focus of this panel. Our goal today is to highlight the tension between disruption and transition, the iterative nature as testing and experimentation helps us refine our original problem statements, and the advantage of frequent touch points with operators throughout the development process. At DARPA, our mission is to both create and prevent strategic surprise, the type of technological surprise that is not evolutionary, but is revolutionary, the type of surprise that is disruptive not only in the eyes of our enemies, but also to our own services based on paradigm shifts that change how we approach the preparation for and the conduct of war. Whether that's a mental shift from an Iraq and Afghanistan focus to a near peer competition or disruption through speed to the force. Depending on who you talk to and what day of the week it is, transition is either a magical word or it's the most cursed of all curse words. It can take on many forms, establishment of a formal program of record, when the armed services have a long-term plan to build and deliver equipment to soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen, and guardians, technology insertion into existing programs, internal use at DARPA to develop new concepts, commercial use, or in this case, direct to operations. For Stowe, this direct to operations approach aligns closely with the DevSecOps mindset, an approach that integrates development security, and operations requirements throughout the engineering process. So let's briefly get back to Q's lab and Bond's watch. What got us to that point? The point of having something developed and tested in time for a real world application? Where did the demand signal come from? How do you increase the odds that your technology is going to actually leave the lab and find a home in the field? And what happens next? How do we get adopted beyond that first individual use? How do we scale? We're going to touch on some of that in our initial comments, but are counting on you to drive the discussion a bit further, a bit deeper during the question and answer period. I'd like to go ahead and welcome and introduce our panel. Colonel Benjamin Bach Bishop is a pilot in the Air Force flying multiple platforms, including the F-35. He's the Air Force and Space Force liaison officer at DARPA, a graduate of the Air Force Weapons School, and recently completed a role as acting program manager in DARPA's Information Innovation Office. Ms. Rebecca Gassler joins us from the Navy's Program Executive Office, Integrated Warfare Systems, where she serves as the acting director for development and integration. Over the last two years, she stood up and delivered the minimum viable product for Project Overmatch, the Navy's effort responsible for developing a unified response to the data infrastructure and tools and analytics needed at operational and tactical levels. Major Patrick Franks joins us from the Army's 75th Ranger Regiment, the pointy end of the spear. Pat has been a key partner in developing, testing, and scaling DARPA's secure handhelds on assured resilient networks at the Tactical Edge program known as SHARE. Commander Matt Thatcher is an active duty nuclear submarine officer, having served on both Los Angeles and Virginia class submarines. Prior to coming to DARPA, he served as the director of the President's Emergency Operations Center. He is currently the Navy liaison officer to DARPA. And we work together with program managers to identify, validate, and develop opportunities to partner with services and organizations. This panel is an example of the Strategic Technology Office ecosystem where we have Air Force, Army, Navy, it's a partnership across the services, working together to solve mission-relevant challenges, a partnership with the intent to transition directly to operations like previous DARPA programs, command post of the future, multi-domain analytics, and persistent close air support. 
So Rebecca, if you don't mind, can you kick us off by sharing about your overmatch experiences over the last two years and how those efforts are setting the stage for a rapid DevSecOps approach hand in hand with operators to be effective today? Sure. <clears throat> so uh, about two years ago, uh, Chief of Naval Operations um, released a letter that said, uh, Admiral Doug Small, I need you to bring us the Naval Operational Architecture faster. You need to get after decision advantage in a distributed maritime operations environment, go. There was no written requirements, there was no plan, there was no staff. Admiral Small called me and said, uh, Rebecca, pick your team, uh, you know, let's go for it. Uh, all we really knew is that we had to, uh, we had four pillars we had to work against. It was networks, infrastructure, data, tools, and analytics. And what we really settled into was the what and the how. The what we had to do um, to, to go after a, a peer or near-peer adversary is we had to bring a software-defined network of networks. Um, that enables us to go faster. When I don't always have to bring a new antenna and a new radio and a new modem every time uh, I need to change my comms, I can go a lot faster. And then I needed to bring the applications. And those applications uh, speed up that, that decision loop. Uh, they provide additional knowledge to the operators. But I can't do that quickly without the how. Um, and I, this is where the service has had a lot of homework to do, and they're all working on it still. And the how is to bring a DevOps environment or a DevSecOps environment, um, first and foremost. And so there's a lot of people that have software pipelines, um, and then they stop, and then you burn a CD, and then you field it the, uh, the old-fashioned way. And so we've actually um, connected all the way to the ships um, via the networks. We can push applications all the way to the ships now. Haven't gotten to the aircraft yet. Uh, we have a lot more flight safety concerns we have to worry about when we do that, but we're working on, on those types of offerings as well. And the other is through the data. And I definitely do not want a data standard for all. Um, we have plenty of data standards. We don't need any more. Um, but what we have to do is we have to uh, make much better use of our data. We have to expose all the data that we've hidden or dropped on the floor. We have to move it to the right part of the network. And through the, the DevOps pipeline and the, uh, that data architecture, we uh, create a lot of opportunities for, for non-traditional performers, for s and academia, small business, to now build a field capability onto our platforms because they don't have to know how to bolt a rack of equipment to a ship. They don't have to do all their own IA work by themselves. Um, and we can go a lot faster when I can push software um, to ships underway and I don't have to wait for their whole deployment cycle. And so one of the neat things about that is understanding through the, the Navy LNO, being able to interact with changes that are happening in the services when they don't have requirements, they don't have an understanding, but they're trying to move in a direction. And how do we then turn around and bring DARPA technology and integrate with that? In a similar fashion, Pat, could you talk a little bit about the 75th Ranger Regiment, another partner that we've worked with, uh, a little bit of the background of the organization, and then maybe some of your interaction with Mary? Yeah, sure. Um... So for the 75th Ranger Regiment, our, our core mission is to uh, conduct a joint forcible entry into Knesset or uh, denied space in order to seize uh, strategic terrain, right? So what does that mean? Uh, so whenever uh, deterrence fails or if there's a crisis, uh, we interject our force in order to uh, bend that crisis response back down into uh, intolerable or, or back into competition. Um, and the way that we do that is through a very rigorous uh, op cycle. Um, so uh, the 75th Ranger Regiment is a little bit different from your regular um, infantry brigade combat team uh, because we have that mission. We specially select and uh, train uh, the Rangers to conduct uh, that mission set. And then we, on our ops timeline, we have three battalions that uh, exercise that multiple times a year. Um, so uh, in, in a little context and background, you know, we were uh, very much involved in the global war on terror. And as technology uh, started to uh, come into the battlefield, uh, the communicators on the ground had the, uh, the awesome task of taking all that new technology and trying to uh, make it to where we had dominance of, of any environment that we went into. Um, and so we kind of built the network from the tactical edge backward, um, whereas sometimes we like to go strategic down to the tactical. Uh, and so making sure that we're building uh, those bridges on both sides of the river and they're gonna meet in the middle is uh, extremely important. Um, but one of the biggest things that we learned uh, when you talk about data, um, the platforms that we're um, building, the platforms we're fielding, have a lot of limitations and constraints. One of the biggest ones of those is persistence of data. 
Um, and the other part of that is network resources. Um, how does the electromagnetic spectrum enable me to provide situational awareness and, and enable mission command for the commander on the ground? Um, and through that, you know, just basically, uh, you know, you've got really strong rangers, really bright people, and, and we're trying to fix it on our own and, and just kind of uh, and asking for help sometimes. But that's how we ran into uh, Dr. Shugart and her team, uh, Jason uh, Schutte, and we started with SHARE. Um, because we, we build a tactical mission network and we deploy it uh, into, into contested, denied space. And we have to do that every single time. Uh, when you talk about, we were talking in the back about uh, command structure versus command systems. Um, and so from a communicator's perspective, it kind of comes down to, well, who do I need to talk to? Where does the data need to go? So SHARE enables us to, to make sure that the data persists and that we have the network um, is resilient enough to survive that that contested space. So you have a program manager that has an idea in her head. You've got uh, an LNO that has a frame of reference for possible targets. Can y'all talk about how you get that linked up uh, between, please go ahead. Sure, yeah, I'll take that first. Uh, yeah, so partnerships are very, very important early on in the program manager's life cycle of a program. Uh, partnerships come from both the program manager level and leadership level with the services. Uh, in order for relationships to be developed and the gaps and hard problems to come in from the services, uh, the liaisons and the program managers need to get out there to see those gaps and hard problems real time. Uh, one of the things that the LNOs do in the office and that the services do uh, in this effort is to bring program managers on board uh, and into different squadrons and different units. Uh, off on submarines, out on aircraft carriers. What that does is it allows the program manager to see firsthand and communicate with the sailors, marines, soldiers, uh, what that hard problem is, what are they facing? Are there seven screens in a control room that they're looking at to try to make a decision off of, uh, to coordinate to somebody to steer a ship or to manage uh, you know, a network or something like that? Uh, so that, that allows that program manager in depth uh, discussion and collaboration and allows them to sort of vector their programs uh, to potentially uh, areas of weakness that we have in the services to date. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that. That's one of the really fun things about being a operational liaison as DARPA is having those conversations <laughs> yeah. and being able to plug program managers in with the operator. Uh, I get pretty passionate about it because it's all about getting technology into the warfighter's hands to be able to make differences. And that's one of the great things about being at DARPA is, you know, it matters. We're m literally changing the world and changing it for the better for our, you know, national security enterprise. So, for example, two weeks ago, I took some pro uh, program managers and a deputy director, office deputy director, out to Luke Air Force Base where I, I served previously and got to introduce them into the F-16 community. And they got to see what it was like to see the world from the cockpit of an F-16, which is pretty awesome, uh, <laughs> I, I will say from experience, having flown uh, F-16s. But also, perhaps even more importantly, they got to see the training that required them to be in the cockpit, the, all of the you know, medical requirements, all the physiological requirements. They got to meet the maintainers that prepare the aircraft and see that operating environment. So we talked sustainment and logistics trails. Those, those are important parts uh, for program managers to, to see. Uh, fly the airplane, sit in the brief, and also perhaps even more importantly, the debrief. See what the lessons learned were uh, for the pilots. So being able to create that environment, and if I can put a program manager in with an F-35, an F-16 pilot, and perhaps a maintainer, a great uh, innovation emerges from that uh, enterprise. And it helps for tech transition because now the program actually is oriented in a way that makes it easy for the services to take it over and to translate. That's just one small example, but it is a lot of fun and it's really personally rewarding being able to see that uh, you know, those ideas emerge uh, and actually start to uh, trans transition. Yeah, and, and one, one uh, thing to tie in there on vectoring the program into different ways, uh, one example that I can give you is Liberty Lifter. It's in the brochure, uh, the seaplane. Uh, we met with Military Sea Lift Command, which does uh, a lot of the overseas logistics uh, for Transcom and the Navy. And they were pulling out ideas like, what, what about making it a hospital ship, a fast-moving hospital ship? So if the next uh, crisis, you know, Hurricane Katrina or, 
you know, uh, you know, crisis like that happens, we have now an aircraft that can do what the mercy and comfort can do. Yes, it can be a logistics ship, but can also be something else. And so interacting with those service uh, partners very early helps the program manager think in other ways as well uh, for multiple transition paths, not just the one that they may think of, you know, when they first start the program. Absolutely. So, yeah, so I think, so, so I'm in the acquisition community, right? So we, you know, buy, field, and sustain things, widgets, capabilities, right? And so I think there's a kind of a, a triad here. So we have the operational community that absolutely drives that need, right? And then you have the people that have the great ideas and can go fast and can take a lot more risks than you can in an acquisition program. But you've got to drag us uh, dinosaurs and all of our, you know, bureaucrats along as well, right? Because when you leave that thing behind on the ship or whatever, we're going to have to come behind and say, now what do we do with it? How do we integrate into our bigger systems? How do we make sure it's supported and we have all the training material and the spares and, and such? And I think that that early relationship sometimes gets overlooked because we do all this really cool work we take it out to all this experimentation these events and then later on the program office comes in and I think there's opportunity there to work um, kind of both directions with the operational community and the acquisition community at the same time so that that transition does become seamless right yep um, and, and and so you know that includes everything from p potentially changing policy on how we fund programs to do that transition early and often as we get to be more software-based, we actually have the opportunity to, to do that and to take capability a lot more often instead of waiting for a whole program to be complete. Yeah, I, I, oh, sorry, sir. No, I, ahead, I was going to say on, on that piece, uh, we actually invited uh, uh, DARPA down to our, our MLATs, our multilateral airborne training, uh, where all the, the Air Force comes in, all joint players in order to achieve this dominance, right? And and uh, it was actually a uh, Third Battalion 375 was was down there doing it, and they're doing this offset infill, and uh, and all these programmers and and the project manager are down there with the Rangers, and and there were some issues in the code, and and you look around, and then there's a, a coder sitting right next to a Ranger saying, hey, I need this to do that, and real time changing the code, changing it to where when they deploy it into the field, it works, and uh, having some scar tissue from. Uh, increment two or the Army's program to get comms on the move, um, you only have sometimes one good shot to get buy-in. And I think that having the developers there and, and getting that trust built with commanders, um, because once the boys and, and the girls see it down at the tactical edge, it's gonna work, it's gonna percolate its way back up as a requirement because you know, once it, you know, for us, it, it takes what we call technical debt, right? At one point, there was one ranger in there trying to provision an EUD at a time, right? And so just the workload of doing an entire battalion, over 400 EUDs before this operation has to go. Uh, and then working with DARPA, they automated that, and now we're provisioning companies' worth within minutes, right? And that's the kind of impact that you can have, is, is you can take that technical debt, that weight out of that ranger's rucksack so that he can focus on the mission. Right, and, and that's, that's some of the things that we, we saw once the boys saw it, once the commanders saw it, having the opportunity to bump steer that program a little bit. And what, what's interesting is you said the, the soldiers sitting there saying, the rangers sitting there, I, want, I needed to do this now. Right. But Rebecca, you were talking to me previously, what about when the soldier doesn't know that, what to ask? Yeah, so we get a, from the, from the fleet, for example, we get a priorities list. And sometimes it says, I need more missiles. That's an, I won't say it's easy, but at least I know what to do when they say that. <laughs> When I say, I have this gap because I can't do this, well, how do you go solve that gap, right? And so in Project Overmatch, for example, um, you know, we had a core engineering team, right? But we had a, a set of advisory teams in each of the warfighting domains, as well as S&T, that actually helped bring all those ideas to kind of potentially solve those gaps. And then we actually had a, um, a, a, a warfighters a group and so think Top Gun, that got mentioned earlier, right? But there's a, we have a Top Gun for every single domain, right? We have an information warfare domain, Top Gun, if you will. We have one for surface, for mining. We had representatives from all those, and those are your tactics, tactics instructors. They're the ones that develop that. They would sit in, and we bring them all together, and we try and figure out which technologies, which capabilities um, would fill some of those gaps. And then they actually take ownership of the, that, that agile requirement cycle um, for our applications. They're driving what, I needed to do this next. In your next sprint, I need you to add this feature. And they're seeing that, that incremental improvement very quickly. And I think one of the keys with that incremental improvement 
is once we get into that cycle where we can push those updates really quickly, it's also not a big bang training cycle. Um, you know, our Admiral would always say like, you know, Yelp didn't send someone to my house to teach me how to use the new button, <laughs> right? I just figured it out because I only change a little bit at a time, right? And so we only ch make those incremental changes. I don't have to go through massive training cycles and have big schoolhouses either. So there's a lot of things that change throughout the entire life cycle when you actually start speeding up this transition. So there's a, there's a piece of it where we're talking about the, the actual tech as it's seen in the interface and how it's handled by the, the operator. Uh, but one of the benefits of being out and spending time and doing that direct operations inter interaction is understanding the environment. Uh, could you all talk about the range of environments that you really don't understand until you are suffering and pain and misery with? <laughs> well, if it's suffering, pain, and misery, that sounds like a ranger question. Uh, <laughs> it is. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I think it, you know, uh, I get to work with America's best. You know, my heroes are walking the hall with me every single day, and some of that is the passion, right? Yeah. You've got guys who, uh, Medal of Honor recipients, you know, the, the history and the lineage, like going back to Point to Hawk, right? And, and it, being in an organization like that, if you can't get motivated uh, to go and to give that ranger what they need to win, uh, because it will not be them that failed you, right? That's part of our creed. Um, you know, we're going to fight on to the ranger objective, though we'd be the lone survivor. And so it was really interesting in that same 375 MLAT, those programmers seeing everything that these guys are going through, the, the rain, the dirt, the muck, like, hey, I've got a 100-pound rucksack, and you're going to put another thing on me and call me enabled. Um, <laughs> like, how do I take that off of you so that you can fight at, at speed? And uh, those programmers are sua sponte, right? That's our motto of their own accord. They they move the program forward outside of that sprint cycle um, because now that we're connecting their passion with a purpose that matters, and that's winning. So, yeah, I, I, I oh, go ahead. So, no, to, to bridge on that, like operating environment, so I was a commander up in uh, Alaska, Allison Air Force Base outside of Fairbanks. So, the Arctic environment is another one that comes to mind. Uh, in terms of hostile environment to be, uh, to be in. So being able to link a uh, program manager, uh, Dr. Ann Trever up there with the Arctic Survival School, and she got to see uh, operations up there and the, the flying operations, that comes to mind. And how do you build a program that can actually have an application for you know, perhaps a unit uh, that's operating in, in that environment? Another one, you mentioned the weapons school in Top Gun. Uh, uh, General Shaw mentioned it this morning, brought a smile to my face, because uh, I remember seeing the, the original. But our weapons schools, like you said, the, the tactical experts. Uh, so bringing program managers to those uh, venues to see the tactical problems they are trying to, to work now and then identify the gaps uh, and the capabilities that they don't have, that's where DARPA can kind of uh, be inspired in order to take some technology and build a program that can help fill that, uh, fill that yeah. gap. So again, that's, that's another, a lot of fun. Another one is the undersea domain. Mm -hmm. right. uh, we have to come up to periscope depth to maintain comms with the carrier battle group or, or our uh, superiors in command. That's a, a perilous process and we have to go slow when we're at periscope depth. Uh, what if there's a way that we could communicate and not go to periscope depth? Those are the things. You know, these technologies, these advancements that could help us fight uh, even better. Well, just to piggyback off of what would help us fight better and what will help us win better, when I, when I think of, you know, JADC2, um, Pat Franks believes, you know, tactical mission networks would be strategically decisive. Um, so what are we doing uh, to enable the guy that's carrying that network with him in, into that, that breach um, to make the decision, right? So who are we empowering with this technology, right? And I think that that, you know, not to be philosophical about it, I think that's why the American experiment works is because we believe in little groups of paratroopers. We believe in enabling the individual um, to empower them to make those decisions. Um, and I think that if we... Uh, use that technology, give it to, um, you know, trusted agents as far as, you know, whether it's a ranger or a submariner or anybody, and we're allowing them not to, we don't have to have a kill chain all the way back uh, somewhere, but how do we work that policy bureaucracy decision to where that guy can make the decision, close that, what I, what I call kill bubble, where he can, you know, sense, make a decision, and then execute uh, based upon his rules of engagement and, and his, his core belief. Yeah, I think one of the things that we have to look at is there are a lot of 
projects and IRAD and, and everything going on, and they're being solved sometimes without the context of the environment, right? right. right? So uh, I work, you know, for the Navy. We have ships. I do not trail a fiber barge with a big reel behind me, right? So everyone wants to bring some machine learning. Right. Cool. Um, I have a soda straw. Um, and so I can't push all that data around the network. So you could bring me the coolest algorithm that needs to train live. I can't use it, right? So we've got to think through the entire context of how we, how we do that and like how we do it within the, the capabilities we have now. So there's a lot of technologies we can use, but we can't use them always in the environments that, that our operators are in. Mm -hmm. Well, I think when we start looking at trying to operate in a joint environment and we want to go to some set standard and we don't account for the fact that the Navy uses certain wavelengths or forms <laughs> because they need to. The Air Force is in a different environment. The Army's in a different environment. So you have to come up with something that accounts for legacy systems but also accounts for, for differences in, in needs. I think that's kind of critical. Uh, you talked a little bit about how we need to make sure that we're not pushing too far with things that are crazily advanced, but that's part of what DARPA does. Matt, could you talk about, I mentioned disruption versus transition and the tension earlier. Could you yeah. dig into that? So, so DARPA is actually also disruptive in a good way. And, and I'll give you an example of one in the Navy. Uh, unmanned surface vessels. There was a time where the Navy was not ready for unmanned surface. They didn't believe that it would work. Uh, but we were able to create the unmanned surface vessel uh, technology and advance that forward through the active program. And now it's Sea Hunter. We were able to prove that they could follow coal regs, uh, which is the uh, net international collisions at sea regulations, and we were able to show that it works. And now, in uh, the maritime strategy for the Chief of Op Naval Operations, unmanned is a huge part of the, the strategy moving forward. And it's making uh, leaps and bounds, you know, advancement ahead both in surface and now in undersea as well, mm -hmm. uh, and then also in air. So uh, one, one example where DARPA may have an idea or, or fill a gap or hard problem or solve that in a way that we're not really comfortable with yet, but it's so far ahead and, and that engagement with the services helps to establish, hey, that, that's a really good idea and that, that's solving our, our requirement mm -hmm. in a different way that we thought possible and that, that constant communication early at the stages of the program development and at the leadership level with the services is crucial for that. So I'll dovetail on that as well. Um, especially in the Air Force, uh, we heard Dr. Hicks mention the Have Blue program uh, that created the um, 117, and I'm an F-35 pilot, so you know lineage goes back to that. Uh, DARPA created that, and the Air Force didn't even know to ask for that technology, right? <laughs> uh, I think another example is remote piloted aircraft, yeah, UAVs. You know, DARPA was you know a pivotal you know, factor in pushing that technology forward. Uh, and sometimes this, if DARPA's doing its job, the service doesn't quite know what to do with this technology right. because it's so different. Uh, I think looking forward, uh, we've had some really great panels on robotics and artificial intelligence. Uh, there's a, a program manager by the name of Lieutenant Colonel Hal Heffron. Uh, he's uh, managing the ACE program, uh, Air Combat Evolution. Some of you may have seen the Alpha Dogfight trials where an AI agent was you know, flying against an F-16 pilot. So looking at uh, autonomy and how that works into uh, air operations. Uh, and pushing, like if you have collaborative combat aircraft, what does that look like? How do you organize, train, and equip? Um, like we were talking about earlier, from the acquisitions perspective, the technology is great, but sometimes the technology is the easy part, is like how do you create the organizations that can uh, adapt this technology, sustain it, uh, and then also from a weapons school perspective, develop the tactics, techniques, and procedures to actually use that te technology. So it's right. really m very much an ecosystem. Uh, Commander Thatcher mentioned partnerships and then having the partnership with the operator, the acquisition community, the, the headquarters staff to, you know, to articulate the requirements, educating them on what they could ask for, what is the realm of the feasible, that's where DARPA, DARPA puts. So I think it's kind of neat we have our acquisitions and our operator <laughs> yeah. right next to each other, <laughs> right? right? Um, yeah. the liaisons and outside because that's really symbolic of you know, the, the very um, you know, important uh, partnerships that you have to establish in, right. in the transition process. I think the autonomy one is interesting. We did have several panels earlier because what we've done thus far is we have you know, uncrewed the platform and then put the crew in the rear and then doubled the size of the crew and then passed all the data back and then made decisions in the rear. And we can't do that. We don't have those pipes, right? And so 
pushing forward and figuring that autonomy piece out. So as acquisition, we can bring the pipes and we can tell you what's in the realm of the possible for the pipes and the bandwidth and the spectrum and the, the Intel community will tell us what's gonna be there or not during the fight. But we've got to figure out those technologies and the program offices really aren't tasked with that right now. We don't have requirements for that, right? right? We're still working on fielding you know, decades old technology, let's be honest. But um, so I think that's a great place for, for DARPA and for the, the larger community that works on those really tough problems to start bringing solutions in and bringing them into the experimentation um, realm. You know, something that has sort of, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, I was, I was just gonna say, as far as like speed of transition, um, so when you, when you have operational use cases and you're partnered with a, a unit um, of action, uh, just kind of how SHARE has, has kind of gone on a tra trajectory. Um, you know, Lieutenant General Morrison has a very hard job in the Army right now uh, trying to do the integrated tactical network and how that ties into air battle management and, and project overmatch and, and like a joint service problem. And uh, General Ray at the Army's Futures Command Network cross-functional team, a, another extremely hard problem. And so if we could take a little weight out of their rucksack with SHARE and how do we create a flat, joint, coalition-capable um, battle edge network um, really kind of transform when you want to talk about disruptive technology, you know, kudos for inventing the internet and then kudos to, you know, Dr. Shugart and her team about changing the protocol, right? We haven't changed the way that the network really communicates since it was created, right? So now we're, we're kind of talking in the tactical mission network arena of legacy TCP IP, right? Instead of asking the network for network resources, I'm asking the network for data. So what does that mean, right? Um, so in the tactical environment, there's gonna be data generated. I'm gonna come into contact with data in that environment. And then do I have the tools and things necessary to gain inference from that and move it forward and then share it with my partners, right? I mean, pretty awesome acronyms with DARPA. Y'all do better than the Army does sometimes, <laughs> right? Yeah. But you know, it, it does kind of speak to how disruptive this technology can be um, because I like to say digital modernization happened. Um, you know, how do we integrate you know, a cell phone or an end user device and then allow that to, to help us at you know, an operational relevancy. Um, but I think you know, it came out, General Ray was like, hey, I need this in Cape Set 27, uh, the capability set, saw what it could do, it's in Cape Set 23 now, and then it's gonna be in Project Convergence later this fall. Um, so if you're a program manager and you get lightning in a bottle, right, you're, serving the, you're solving the joint forces problems, it will get accelerated. Uh, at a speed that really blows my mind. I wasn't ready for it. Before we go into to Q&A, you know, as I sit here and listen to the language that I've been speaking for 21 years, uh, I, I think that chances are this can be a little, a little daunting, some of the military terminology, the organizations, the interactions. Uh, but what I would like to highlight, if you're looking at coming and becoming a program manager at DARPA or a performer with DARPA, is you have a team that is sitting there to support you. Uh, when Pat was talking about Mary coming down and working with Cher, he mentioned Jason Schutte, one of her CETA contractors who had deep experience uh, through the Marines that he was bringing to help support her as she was moving forward. We have LNOs in DARPA that are able to help get those introductions and the interactions going. It's not a place where you're left alone. It's a place where you are brought to become wildly successful. Bring in your, your expertise. We don't expect you to know everything about the transition partner. We're going to help you understand the key points of that. I think that that's a uh, one thing that I'd like y'all to take away from this. If we could go ahead and go to a question and answer period at this point. Okay, so the first question from the audience, what happens when a program or a technology fails when working with operators? So I, um, I think, I guess an example would be if we had come and done share and it failed miserably, y'all would hate DARPA? Is that what would happen? Uh, I'll, go ahead, Bob. I'll jump Please on kick this off. One. <laughs> so I, I did two assignments in operational test and evaluation. Awesome. When one of our sayings was a failure was a successful test, right. because sometimes it's more important to figure out what doesn't work than to actually figure out what the answer is. Right. And sometimes we realize through the failure we're not actually asking the right question for the technology to solve. Yeah. So if there is that um, that ecosystem established and that relationship. Uh, then that means it's an opportunity to iterate and, and go faster, especially with some of the you know, concepts we were discussing earlier. Yeah, and I, I also think environment plays a piece. Like if it fails in the environment in the final phases of testing uh, that it's meant to perform in, say the deep sea, call it very caustic environment, and we learn lessons from that failure, it, it, it's a win. Yeah. It either moves forward into another DARPA program or it, you know, we follow those, get those lessons learned, bring that back, and then, 
you know, maybe add another operational test where, you know, we're working on uh, developing, uh, you know, solutions to those, those failures. Mm -hmm. I, say, I think, yeah. too, it's about um, demonstrating that, that capability in the right um, environment or, or experiment. So, uh, you know, I know the Navy uh, or the Army with Project Convergence, we, they have really been building a series of fleet battle problems, experimentation, whole fleet experimentation, sets of, of events just to bring these technologies so they get feedback. Right. You know, when I see a failure, I think someone, you know, if someone dies, that's a bigger problem than like my app didn't work and I had to turn it off, right? And so it, criticality kind of matters too. But I think the services are doing, are trying to do their, their best to allow these technologies in often early um, and, and they're really trying to enable that. Yeah, and Rebecca, that brings a really good point about another uh, feature of establishing a strong relationship with the services early is that the testing environments that they allow you. Uh, not only just funding per se, but if you need a submarine or an aircraft or a ship to get underway, that's time and that costs money. Those are things that the services can provide. Uh, the testing ranges that we have at, in all the services uh, provides that, that avenue to test the, the great technology coming out of DARPA uh, with that relationship. So Yeah, I guess the last thing I'll say about failure and working at DARPA is it's different because if all DARPA programs are successful, then DARPA isn't being DARPA <laughs> and reaching right. far enough. Far enough yeah. So there's kind of an expectation like some of the portfolio isn't going to work out as planned. And what's important is that you learn from those failures and continue on. And Right. Uh, yeah. But I'd like to hear from the operator perspective. Yeah, I, I think it comes down to humility. Um, you have to be willing to fail, like willing to try. And I think that to that point, if, if you're not willing to do that, you're not reaching high enough. Yeah. Uh, because the first time that we need to go into a joint all domain coalition environment can't be when it's it's yeah. game time. And and we have to practice that. And I know from the regimental perspective with, with Colonel Kiersey and Sergeant Major Johnson, you know, they, they want, you know, to, to sweat in training. They want to bleed in training so that we don't have, you know, Rangers going out there with something that isn't proven. And I, I say this to academia, I say this to industry. You know, your level of commitment to it is, is one thing, but ours is, is kind of a little bit different, right? So we see risk <laughs> a little bit differently uh, because when that light goes green or when the when the balloon goes up, so to speak, like, you know, there's there's people moving to the sound of the guns. So, uh, so we're playing for keeps and, awesome. you know, if, if you're afraid to fail, like, awesome. Yeah. Uh, our next question from the audience, what can the R&D and academia communities do in order to better accelerate development and implementation of new technologies and systems to the operational domain? So, so there's a ton of opportunities out there for this, right? So there are broad area announcements that go out from DARPA, from Office of Naval Research, from a lot of the different research, the government research laboratories that um, enable participation. There are, uh, from our side, we do things like prize challenges, we do hackathons, um, and, and the, the, the interesting thing about that is, you know, anyone can enter. Usually we try and do them unclassified, rel A, right? We create representative data sets and problems. Um, the even better part of that is those are actually can be used to justify a uh, contract award after that without a full competition. Mm -hmm. And so you actually can get into the whole cycle a lot faster by participating in those various um, events that we put on. I would say it goes back to understanding the problem because um, you know, from a communicator's perspective, especially in the tactical environment, I have to employ a system that's whole spectrum and there's problems along the whole OSI, right? So I'm, I can't say that in the Ranger Regiment because people look at me like, pal, what are you talking about? But I feel <laughs> safe saying that here, so if not. Um, but yeah, so there's, because we understand the problem. We understand our, our limitations, and our constraints. And if you, you know, if you're just super geeked out about the application layer, we have a problem that you can help us solve, right? If you're super geeked out about waveform transmission and, and how we do that, we have a lot of problems that you can help us solve um, basically to enable the warfighter there. Awesome. Yeah, and I think understanding the, the operations, the con ops piece of it, and having a story, right? So understanding what the end result is and having uh, an idea of how to translate that. Uh, if this works, if this miracle technology works, this is what it will do, and this is what will make your lives better. Having that story baked in early uh, and understanding, like, like Pat was saying, uh, the environment and, and just that, that helps a lot uh, to translate the great technical work that you are doing to the warfighter. 
So I was listening to uh, Dr. Bill Coulter uh, talk to EEI the other day uh, about the, the interaction with program managers with ideas. And, and another way to look at this is to go look not so much, I mean, watch the BAAs, but also look at what programs are being run by program managers and look and see if your area of interest aligns with one and reach out. Start talking to them about some of the, the interactions. And if you don't see something there, but you think that there's a possible neat aspect of what you're doing that could make a difference, then reach out to one of the office directors. But touch base with your idea, look for where it might possibly fit, and then as we get a chance to ingest it, that could start shaping a future BAA. Your idea could lead to a program manager starting a program or potentially to you coming to DARPA and becoming a program manager. I think that's another way that you can start getting a feel for what problems are out there and how you can, can yeah, impact and, it. And you have the liaisons for support too. We're on the, web page, the common web page for DARPA. There's one service liaison for every service represented. Uh, if you have a, an idea or you wanna sync up with someone that, that you've heard about or a program that you've heard about, send us an email. I know I'm putting us on, on point for <laughs> numerous emails here, Bob. <laughs> But please, that's our job. That's that's our job. job is to help connect you guys. So, And at, at, to that point, I think it, it goes with having a story. Because um, if people don't understand what you're talking about, it's, it's really hard to communicate like why your widget's going to change the world. And the way I do that is you know, read what our pacing threats are, are writing, like about how they're going to counter uh, our networks, uh, how they're going to counter uh, American power projection. And then also read history, right? And that's one of the things I try to do to shape uh, context is, hey, what if Market Garden happened tomorrow, right? How would it go differently? How could we ensure that, you know, if the first British pair is in Arnheim, that we can either alert them to a Panzer division moving their way, or we can insert a unit like the 75th Ranger Regiment in order to allow them to withdraw under pressure instead of being completely annihilated. And I think it's, you know, part of innovation is doing something old in a new way as well. Um, so being able to look back in history and say, hey, if, if this were to happen today, how would we do it? And I, th I think that identifies gaps that I'm, I can't see because I'm too busy, uh, you know, trying to, you know, uh, do my day job. <laughs> so. and, and, and there's a line there. There's a line of expectation where you, you have an area of, of expertise. So if you've got that widget and it's cool, then share the widget. Right. and let us help you develop the narrative if it's a widget that has a narrative. Right. And I think that kind of ties into what will be our, probably our last question from the audience. How do you increase the odds that your technology is going to actually leave the lab and find a home in the field? Yeah, so I'll say have the narrative, like understand how this fits into the application uh, for the warfighter, similar to, you know, if you're transitioning to the commercial market, understand what your business case and what that market looks like. There's a lot of analogies to that. Yeah. So understand what that mission would be. Um, I would say... Also, get your technology out of the lab and try to demonstrate it in an operationally relevant environment. Because uh, for me, when I'm engaging with uh, Air and Space Force leaders, and I'm talking about DARPA programs and technology, the brief is much stronger when I have videos that show the technology actually working <laughs> instead of just PowerPoint slides that show the... Uh, so that's one of the things we try to do at DARPA is demonstrate the tech and, uh, to get it out, and that makes the transition easier. Yeah. I'll say it can be daunting to even know what their operational environment is, right? Because not, not everyone here has a clearance and has in access to Intel. Right. But good, bad, or otherwise, we publish a lot of things. Uh, open source, right? And so uh, go look at the national defense strategies. The CNO just published his NAV plan 2022. He lays out his priorities and how he wants to tackle them in there. It's broad, but you guys are really smart. And you'll think of like, oh, that's the broad problem? What if I brought these types of technologies? And the true for ST and acquisition. If we can tie it into those strategies, it's much more likely to get funded too. Um, because we say we're tackling this line of effort and by this year, and it tied into that entire strategy. Um, and I think that that, that context is really important. Yeah, outstanding. Point. Very good. Point. I appreciate that. Uh, great conversation. I really appreciate y'all taking the time to share your thoughts, experiences, and ideas today. Oh, pleasure. Thank you all for your attention and your questions. I'd also like to thank the panelists. Uh, as we wrap up, I'd ask you to keep a couple of things in mind. Uh, DARPA provides an option for developmental research, but with touch points with operators to help refine your efforts, which means that performers and program managers need to be prepared for frequent and very often blunt uh, customer <laughs> feedback. How you doing, Pat? <laughs> so what are some of the next steps at that point? Uh, take a moment. We talked about reading the broad area announcements. Check out the program manager pages. See, see what's there, see what's of interest. 
come up with an approach, come up with an idea, something that sort of stretches the realm of the possible, sketch out a path to a solution and submit a proposal. Maybe we're missing something completely. Do you see a technological inflection point and have an insight that if we pursue it, will enhance national security? If either of those are a fit, then bring your curiosity and your creativity and join us, whether it's as a performer, a program manager, or a partner. Bottom line, become a part of this team as we work to change the world. Thank you.